Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Tech Forum session. I'm Ainsley Sparks, uh, the Marketing and Communications Manager at BookNet Canada. Welcome to the first session of Come Taste the Difference Good Management Can Make in Your Crisis. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to take a moment to recognize that the BookNet that BookNet Canada acknowledges its staff, board, and partners work upon the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Wendat, and Huron Indigenous peoples, the original nations of this land. Melissa Mack lives and works upon the traditional territories of the Muscogee, Muscogee Creek Indigenous peoples, and the land is subject to Session 116. BookNet Canada endorses the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada and supports an ongoing shift from gatekeeping to space making in the book industry. If you haven't already, we recommend you watch the opening ceremony video with Elder Wabagoon of the Laxville First Nation. You can find the link in the reminder emails for this session, or you can contact us at techforum at booknetcanada.ca and we will send it to you. Uh, now for some housekeeping admin things. Uh, if you're having difficulties with Zoom or have any tech related questions, please direct your questions to me in the chat. You can find this option by using the drop down menu above the chat text box, or you can email techforum at booknetcanada.ca. Uh, if you'd like to see live closed captioning for this session, please find the live transcript button in the Zoom menu at the bottom of your screen. Uh, click on it and you'll see the show subtitle option. Um, feel free to keep your cameras on. If you have questions during the presentation, uh, you have some options. Melissa will be pausing occasionally and will invite questions at those times. You can put them in the chat, or if you'd rather ask them anonymously, you can send them directly to the Q&A moderator and we will relay them at the appropriate time. Uh, lastly, we'd like to remind attendees of the code of conduct. Please do be kind, be inclusive, be respectful of others, including of their privacy, be aware of your words and actions, and please report any violations to techforum at booknetcanada.ca. Uh, do not harass speakers, hosts, or attendees, or record these sessions. We have a zero tolerance policy. Uh, you can find the entire code of conduct at techforum.booknetcanada.ca slash code of conduct. Now let me introduce Melissa Mack. Melissa is a corporate crisis preparedness consultant specializing in establishing training and exercising corporate crisis management teams. Her passion is developing and conducting training and tabletop exercises for teams of all maturity levels. Melissa uses her strong attention to detail and deep understanding of team dynamics to create exercises that push crisis management, incident management, and business continuity teams to learn and improve. Melissa knows the most effective ways to exercise a senior leadership team, and she's not afraid to use a hurricane, a cyber attack, or a zombie apocalypse scenario to do it. Over to you, Melissa. Thanks very much, Ainsley. I appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And away we go. Thank you all very much for your time. And thank you to BookNet Canada for hosting and a really well organized conference. I'm always delighted to get the opportunity to get to work, work with you all. Um, it's you're great. Thank you all very much. Um, so as Nancy mentioned, I do want to encourage throughout this session discussion and questions. So please feel free to, um, if you have questions, you're welcome to ask verbally, to put it in the chat, however you feel comfortable. Um, and I will be pausing occasionally to ask specifically for questions and feedback, because I do want to facilitate discussion throughout this. Um, I also very shamelessly will take every opportunity I can to make a Schitt's Creek reference, um, which is why you see the delightful Moira Rose on the slide in front of you um, and why the title of the session <laughs> is the way that it is. Um, I find that Schitt's Creek is one of the things that's gotten me through this pandemic. So I think uh, it's always good to celebrate the good things. Um, so thank you all very, very much for attending. Um, I'm just gonna jump right in. Um, what we're going to be talking about today and in the next session as well, just giving you kind of what to expect for both sessions. So in this session today, um, hopefully you'll be coming away with an understanding of what is a crisis and when we're talking about a crisis for this session, we're talking about a corporate crisis. So not necessarily a personal crisis or a political crisis, but what is a crisis that might affect the company that you work for? Um, and what is crisis management? Specifically, what does good crisis management look like? 
and what does not good crisis management look like. Um, we'll also be uh, talking about how do you examine your organization or your company's current capabilities. And I am throughout this session going to be talking about organizations and companies trying to keep in mind that some folks don't necessarily work for a company or a corporation, that sometimes it's a nonprofit organization, that kind of thing. But when I'm talking in this session about an organization, know that that's what I'm referring to is whoever, whoever your employer is. Um, we're also going to be talking about using a post-incident review as a way to debrief following a crisis, why that can be beneficial, and how to use that to build momentum to develop a program going forward. Hopefully, we'll also be finding ways to create an appetite for preparedness within your organization, your company, whoever you work for. Um, how, do you, how do you start to have the conversations that build the awareness and the desire for, for your company to build or improve on an existing crisis management program. Um, and I put the green stars to indicate that this is where you will get takeaways. So there will be a handout that we'll send out following the session. So you don't have to worry about taking notes fast and furiously from the slides. Um, you'll receive a handout afterwards with the information on it. Um, in the next session, which is on April 6th, we'll be uh, highlighting what the elements of a crisis management program are and how to how to tweak those to fit your organization. Um, we'll talk about identifying and working with key partners in a crisis, because you may not have all of the right, right resources in-house for a crisis, most companies do not. Um, how do you recognize crisis management program elements and those variables, and then tweak those elements and variables to fit appropriately your organization, and looking at the organizational structure, cultural components, mission, that kind of thing. So how do you make, how do you make it work for you? excuse me, we'll also be talking about how do you develop a crisis management program to fit your organization specifically. It's not a one size fit all, fits all approach. So how do you really make it work appropriately for your, for your organization or your company? Um, so starting off with talking about what is a crisis? And this is something that everybody that initially wants to talk about, how do we define a crisis? And the short answer is there's no one solid definition. Um, it's going to depend a lot on, on your organization, on past experiences, and also we want to make sure that we're allowing context to, to play in, because I've seen a lot of companies that typically will try and very clearly define a crisis with a hard and fast rule of here is what is a crisis and here's what's not a crisis. And every time that happens, the next thing that actually happens is without is outside of their definition of what they consider a crisis, but it ends up becoming a crisis for the company. So we need to make sure that we allow for context to, to take part in, in the situation. So generally speaking, when we're talking about a crisis, a corporate crisis, an organizational crisis, a crisis is something that threatens or has the potential to threaten the viability of an organization. And the potential there is a key differentiator because sometimes crises don't have an immediate impact. Sometimes they don't, they don't happen right away. It sometimes bubbles up over time. COVID-19 pandemic is a good example of that. If we think back to January 1st, 2020, I mean, we certainly you know, saw in the news that there, that there was this new strain of the coronavirus that was causing people to get sick, but we didn't know at that point that it would become a global pandemic. Um, it's the kind of thing that bubbles up slowly over time, rather, whereas some crises, there is an activating of an event that is noticeable and immediate, and you know right away, there's something that's not right. Typically there's, you know, sirens going off, lights flashing, that kind of thing. So when we're talking about a corporate crisis, it needs to be able to encompass all of those different possibilities. Um, so typically it can include natural disasters or severe weather. It can include um, reputation incidents. It can include financial incidents. It can include legal incidents. Um, but generally speaking, a corporate crisis is something that will have negative impacts to people that can be a company's employees, customers, neighbors, community members, vendors, suppliers, um, but some kind of negative impact to people. It might have an impact to operations, to your ability to provide goods and or services to your customers. Um, it could have negative impacts to your finances. A crisis can be very costly. Um, it will frequently have negative impacts to reputation, um, and which then threatens your future ability to operate. If your reputation is damaged um, to the point where you're no longer able to maintain or develop new customers, that's going to threaten your future ability to operate. 
Um, so that's a very kind of loose guidelines over what we're considering a corporate crisis, but we'll talk a little bit more about that. And I'm gonna ask for your specific input and some examples that you might be able to think of about a corporate crisis. So I'll give you a heads up now. In a few minutes, I'm gonna ask you to, to give me some examples of, of companies that you've read about in the news or seen that, that have experienced a corporate crisis. So just start churning on that. Um, we also wanna talk about what is good crisis management. Um, and I wanna say that because there's a lot of things that it's not, but generally good crisis management establishes and executes a strategy to respond to a crisis. Crisis management happens at a strategic level. There are certainly components of it that happen at an operational level or a tactical level. There are a lot of related disciplines in the resilience realm. Um, business continuity, for example, is typically at an operational level. IT disaster recovery is at an operational level, sometimes a tactical level. Um, but crisis management generally happens at a strategic level. Um, good crisis management uses a practiced response process, so it's not uh, haphazard. It's something that we have planned for and prepared for and practiced in advance. Good crisis management is led by a cross-functional team which anticipates the needs and concerns of all stakeholder groups. This is a big one. In the process of planning and preparing for a crisis and creating a crisis management program, we need to think through who are all of our potentially impacted stakeholder groups. So if I work for the ACME company, I need to think through who are all the potential stakeholder groups that could be impacted by an ACME company crisis. So for example, employees might be impacted by it. Customers might be impacted by it. Suppliers, vendors might be impacted by it. Community members might be impacted by it. If it's normal times and we're not in a pandemic and we're working in an office, other other tenants of the office building might be impacted by it. Um, regulators certainly come into play. The media, we need to consider traditional and social media, certainly. So thinking through all of those various impacted or potentially impacted stakeholder groups, once we've identified all the stakeholder groups, we need to make sure that there is a member of the crisis management team who is looking out for the needs and concerns of each of those stakeholder groups, which is why we have a cross-functional team put together so that there is somebody on the team thinking about each individual group and what they might need and what their concerns might be in a crisis. Typically, you wanna have somebody who uh, owns the relationship already organically with that stakeholder group, or at least somebody on your, on your support staff, um, both within your organization, thinking through who owns the relationship on a normal basis with each of those potentially impacted stakeholder groups, because uh, it's certainly easier to maintain a relationship rather than try and develop a new relationship in a crisis. Um, and a lot of crisis management, especially the preparedness, is trying to remove as many potential obstacles in advance so that we're stumbling less in a crisis. Um, so that's one way that we, that we do that. We establish these strategic cross-functional teams to really make sure that we're addressing the needs of all potentially impacted stakeholder groups. Um, good crisis management is proactive to the extent possible. Um, a lot in most activations when there's a real corporate crisis and a strategic crisis management team is activated, uh, there will be elements that have not been planned for, that have not necessarily been thought of in advance. That's just the nature of crises. We are. You are all, I'm sure, tired of hearing the phrase, we live in unprecedented times, but it's really true. Um, we, you know, we did not really anticipate the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic would have, depending on what industry you're in, what company you work for, the size of the organization, where you're located, uh, who your employees are. There's so many different potential influences and things that can impact a crisis. This is why we encourage folks to prepare for any type of crisis rather than every crisis. The difference being if you prepare for every crisis, you're thinking through what are the different risks to my company that I need to prepare for? I need to prepare for what kinds of natural disasters, things like this. We see um, a few weeks ago in Texas with the winter storms in Texas that so many people were without power, without water, that kind of thing that a lot, of, a lot of companies were not prepared for that because it was so unfathomable to experience such extreme cold temperatures in Texas and it caught a lot of people off guard. So thinking through that kind of thing, understanding that 
we can prepare for everything that we think might happen to us that could possibly happen to us. But then if we take that approach and plan for specific scenarios, inevitably down the line, something will happen that we have not prepared for that we did not think of. So taking the approach where you're kind of scenario agnostic rather than specifically focused on specific risks or specific scenarios, it helps you be better be able to respond to whatever might happen. Um, which is why we encourage companies to build this cross-functional strategic level crisis management team that can anticipate the needs of any potentially impacted stakeholder group in advance, no matter what the actual crisis situation or scenario is. Um, some things that good crisis management is not. It is not reputation management only. With all due respect to Shonda Rhimes and uh, to Olivia Pope, it is not just reputation management. Um, there's absolutely a component of that in crisis management. You do need good communications. You need people concerned about the reputation of the organization, of specific people, that kind of thing. Um, but that is not the end all be all of crisis management. Good crisis management is not spontaneous. You need to have a team, a plan, a structure in advance, and you need to practice that response mechanism. How does your team respond together to a crisis? Good crisis management is not siloed. Um, this is something that we see a lot of across all industries, across a lot of organizations um, that sometimes, especially in bigger companies, that there will be a person or a team or a group that owns crisis management or that owns business continuity or that owns IT disaster recovery or that owns communications. And sometimes they get so siloed and they don't work well across the organization. Um, even if there is a cross-functional team in place, there's kind of that territorial, I'm gonna maintain the knowledge and the documents for my area. I'm the expert, I know I can handle this. And then a crisis occurs and we find out that that may not be the case. Um, an example of that is um, we worked with a company that we've been doing a lot of crisis management work for them in March of last year, uh, they, they had a business continuity program, but the, their business continuity program leadership was very, very siloed and they did not ever communicate or work with or collaborate with the crisis management folks. So we get to March of 2020 and it's becoming very apparent that they're gonna have to have their thousands of employees work from home on a moment's notice so they went to activate their business continuity plans and they realized that their business continuity plans did not account for any kind of people related impact. So they did not account for the fact that people need to be able to work. They did not account for the fact that um, in a pandemic, some employees might be sick. They might be dealing with childcare. They might be educating their, their children from home. They might be taking care of family members who are ill they might just not be able to do the work. So how do you take into account the people aspects there? Um, and that was, that was largely a result of the business continuity and the crisis management disciplines being very siloed from each other and not collaborating at all. Um, so we find that anytime you see silos start to spring up and kind of those territorial turf battles happen within our organization, it can really create a lot more obstacles that we're trying to prevent in, crisis, in a crisis. Um, good crisis management is not, as I mentioned earlier, limited to certain scenarios or risks. So really, we really want to do plan for anything possible, not for everything. Um, I had, um, I've had several clients reach out to me in the past year, um, thanking me for running crisis exercises for them where I, where I ran a zombie apocalypse scenario for them. Um, because they found that it was very helpful when dealing with the pandemic because it stretched their imaginations beyond what they thought was possible and realizing that there are going to be impacts that they did not foresee coming. So that, But they'd already experienced going through an exercise and thinking through what could potentially happen and what might happen that we don't even think of. Um, so that's a good example of a way to, to prepare for anything to happen rather than everything to happen. Does that make sense? Does anybody, I would love to stop, pause here for questions right now. So please feel free um, if you wanna unmute, if you wanna chat any questions. Um, do we have any questions so far about what is, a, what is a crisis? How are we defining a crisis? What is crisis management? What is not crisis management?
Okay, I'm gonna go on, but please do feel free at any time to interrupt me with questions, with comments. Um, I do very much wanna encourage discussion. To that end, we're gonna um, open it up a little bit. I'm gonna ask you um, to go on, if you have a second screen, this might work well. This also works really well on mobile. So if you have your phone handy, open up a, a browser, an internet browser, so still stay on the Zoom call, um, but in a browser somewhere else, on your phone, wherever. I'm gonna ask you to go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and you're gonna enter the code 10683719. And I'm gonna switch screens for a moment. You don't have to write this down. This will be on the next screen as well. Oops, there it is. Um, so you can see it's up here at the top. So menti, M-E-N-T-I.com, and use the code 10683719. There, you don't need to enter a space. You don't have to worry about it. It's just to make it visually easier to process. But I'm gonna ask you, and this is going to generate a word cloud. So letting you know right now, your responses that you're gonna enter into menti.com using this code will show up on this shared screen. So people will be able to see what you're writing, but it's anonymous. So we won't know who is putting in which answer. So this is going to generate a word cloud. Good, yay. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you to think through a company that has experienced a corporate crisis. You can also answer more than once. If you can think of multiple companies, feel free to go ahead and enter multiple companies. Just hit submit after each one. Um, so we've got General Mills, Facebook, Condé Nast, Simon Schuster, uh, SNC Lavalin. Ooh, I forgot about that one. Boston Public Schools, Penguin Random House, Hyatt Hotels, Teen Vogue. That's a recent one. Good. Johnson Johnson. Good. Oh, you guys are coming up with great, great examples. Um, and, and the way the word cloud generates is that the more a specific item is mentioned, the larger the font will appear on the screen. And I will, when um, following this session, we'll send out the slides um, from the session. I will include the responses from Menti in the slides. So you'll be able to refer to those later on. Um, so I'm gonna give you just another minute to come up with, oh, you guys are good at this. You're coming up with really good examples. Oh, this is good. Yeah. My goodness, this, this is so good. There's a, yeah, there's, there's certainly no shortage of <laughs> examples of corporate crises out there. But I do wanna kind of talk through some of these. Um, and I will ask for folks to volunteer for, for why you chose specific examples that you did. What, it, what was the crisis that you're thinking of? Some companies may have more than one. Um, and why, why, in your opinion, was that a corporate crisis? So as we're thinking through, and I want to, this is, I'm going to keep letting folks into responses. This is fantastic. Um, but I do want to call a couple minutes. We do see in the bigger types, so we've gotten multiple responses for Facebook. Does anybody want to chime in and let us know about the Facebook crisis or crises that you're thinking of? The examples? So I'd encourage folks to unmute and, and share with us. Uh, this is Alex from the East Coast. I, I, I would say the, the Russian interference in the US election was sizable. I agree. Yeah, the Russian interference in the 2016 election. I think also the Cambridge Analytica, which was certainly related to that, was, was a big scandal or a big crisis for Facebook. Yep. Um, what about uh, Condé Nast? That's a recent one, I think, related to, to Teen Vogue. Um, but unless there's another Condé Nast crisis that I'm not thinking of, but I'd love to hear what, what y'all are thinking about that. Uh, this is Lauren from BookNet. I'm thinking about the scandal with Bon Appetit um, regarding Condé Nast. And also yep. recently, even last week, about uh, Teen Vogue's uh, new appointed editor. Yep, great examples. And they've had a couple. Um, Amazon is a big one. So more than one person has mentioned Amazon. Tell me about Amazon's corporate crisis. Hi, it's Marissa. Um, they've had a few corporate crises, but uh, I put them in because of their 
the tech industry and how it's being asked to be broken up and they're being, they're acting as a monopoly. Great point. Thank you very much for bringing that up, Marissa. Yeah. So the idea that regulation changes coming in could potentially threaten their business model, their ability to operate, that kind of thing. So yeah, for the, for them, that's absolutely a corporate crisis. Um, Kate, Kate yeah. in the comments also put in employee treatment for Amazon. Exactly. So that would be, that would really be more of a reputation issue as well. It, it has led to boycotts, for example. Yep. Great examples. Um, I saw British Petroleum. That's that's a pretty good textbook example of a crisis. Um, who's who's thinking of British Petroleum there? I, it was Marissa again. I, I put them in. Um, it was because of their CEO and the comments that he made when they were having um, their crisis, saying he just wanted his weekend back. Yes. Yes, the deep water horizon. So they had the big oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Then the response to that. So the oil spill itself, the deep water horizon incident was a crisis for them because it resulted in the loss of 11 lives. It resulted in a large environmental catastrophe. But then they had their CEO go on TV and talk about how he just wanted his life back. So that created an additional crisis on top of the crisis. Um, a meta crisis, if you will. Um, Tylenol is a good one. Talk about textbook corporate crisis examples. Um, who mentioned Tylenol? It's Marissa, I did that one again. <laughs> Marissa, <laughs> you've got so many great examples, I love it. <laughs> that was actually one that I studied in college. It was the textbook example of doing things correctly. Um, someone was puncturing the Tylenol um, capsules and instead of just selling them they recalled all of them and replaced all of them to their own cost but because of what they did their reputation for quality and their reputation for serving their customers was enhanced exactly it's a really really great point i'm glad you mentioned it yeah so they had there was a bad actor that was puncturing or that was lacing tylenol with a poison so it was there were people that would buy Tylenol and take and take Tylenol pills and it would end up poisoning them. So, and this is one of the earliest examples of a product recall that was a voluntary product recall. So Tylenol chose to remove all of their products from the shelves um, to recall all of their products. And that exactly as Marissa said, it really actually enhanced their reputation as a result of the crisis. So it's a good example of, of good crisis management that of course it was, it came at a large cost to them because it was very expensive to recall all of their product. And that meant that for a time, they were not able to sell any Tylenol. But longer term, it really enhanced their reputation. It enhanced their business and, and people thought very highly of Tylenol um, and still largely do because they're no, they know that Tylenol was willing to put customer safety over profits. Um, some really, really good examples here. Um, and I don't wanna spend too much longer, but I will ask if anybody has put in an example that they wanna, that they wanna talk about verbally, I would love that because we have so many good examples. The Royal Family, y'all have been on my group chat. <laughs> I've been talking about that with, with some friends. Um, but if anybody wants to, to call out specifically another example that they gave, I'd, I'd love to. Have um, you know what's a funny one? If I'm am I popping up? I can't even tell. Yes, I can see you, Nassim. Um, that uh, I saw on Twitter yesterday that someone opened and ate their General Mills cinnamon toast crunch, mm -hmm. and there were two shrimp tails in it, like dried sugar coated shrimp tails, and they tagged General Mills and said, uh, "What is this?" And General Mills said, "No, no, no, that is um, sugar at the bottom, uh, like a sugar clumping." And then no, it was like 100% shrimp tails, and then also like black little bits on the cereal itself. Anyway, I just thought like gaslighting someone is not the yeah, <laughs> not the yeah. answer. <laughs> it's definitely not. Yeah, that's a great example. Um, another one kind of related but with a different ending. Do y'all? This was at this point 20 years ago, maybe. So it was a while ago. Um, but Wendy's, the fast food restaurant, had the, and this made the news 
internationally that they um, somebody found and I'm, content warning, this is going to be a little bit graphic for body parts, but somebody found a finger in their chili that they got from Wendy's um, and it made the national news and Wendy's started losing a lot of business because nobody wanted to go eat finger chili. Um, but they, the way that they managed that crisis was they worked with law enforcement officials for, at the, in, the, in the area, I think it was in California where it happened. Um, and they discovered that it was not that it was not a hoax. There was actually a finger, but that somebody had planted it there. It was, I think, organized crime or some kind of revenge or, but it was something that happened after the chili was purchased. Um, and it was like, you know, a payoff or something. I don't remember the exact details, but there was actually a finger and it did not come from Wendy's. Um, but they they allowed the sheriff's office or the law enforcement law enforcement officials to give a press conference and state here are the results of the investigation here's what we found so that it actually cleared Wendy's of wrongdoing and, and showed that no you won't actually end up with a finger in your chili if you get chili from Wendy's um, so I'm gonna move on from that because it's making me a little bit nauseous to think about it <laughs> just. Um, but moving on, it's, it's a great example too of Daryl Mills. So sometimes it actually is something gross in the product and sometimes it's not. A um, lot of good examples here. Does anybody else want to share their, why they, why they shared the example that they did? It's uh, Don in Toronto. Yes. Um, it's interesting to me that, that some crises are quite unintentional. Mm -hmm. Like there's circumstances beyond a company's control that invoke a crisis, but then you know, we have all kinds of companies that are have fraudulent behavior mm -hmm. and somehow expect to avoid notice or, I mean, when I heard about the, the McKinsey's involvement in the opioid, opioid crisis, I was just astounded yeah. that one of the big four consulting firms would engage in such behavior. And uh, it, it just boggles my mind when that happens. That's a great point too. There's there's certainly the distinction between crises that that a company is not necessarily causing, but that is still impacting that is still a corporate crisis for a company, versus crises that where the company is at fault or caused the crisis. Um, a couple of one example that that comes to mind for me is the Volkswagen scandal from a few years ago when it, when it came out that Volkswagen had been selling diesel cars that were seen as very, very fuel efficient, very clean, very environmentally friendly. But in fact, they had installed a cheat code in their software to bypass emissions testing so that it, when cars were tested for emissions, they showed as being much more environmentally friendly than they actually were. Um, so it's an, an example of a company created corporate crisis for sure. Um, and there is there is a difference. There won't necessarily be a difference in how it plays out initially in the media, um, but it can be it can make a difference longer term from reputation perspective, from a legal liability perspective, from a consequences perspective. Um, and a lot of what crisis management is is really managing consequences. Sometimes you're going to a company that is experiencing a crisis that they did not cause will still experience consequences, even if it's not their fault, even if they were not in the wrong necessarily. Um, but good crisis management is how do you how do you manage the consequences of a crisis? Um, it's a great example. Any other any other uh, examples that people want to share verbally with us? Y'all are coming up with great examples. I love it. Um, yeah, oh, Andrew Cuomo. <laughs> yeah, the Cyberpunk 2077 one I thought was really interesting um, because it was a case where this video game had been anticipated for years and it came out and it was buggy. And there was a moment where it looked like, because everything's buggy at the start and it's software and patches get released. But then there was a point where Sony said, enough. We, you, you have overwhelmed our customer care centers. We, we, we are better off not selling your game than selling it and dealing with the consequences. Um, and then Xbox followed and then, and then 
and then so so no matter how fast they were working on patches mm -hmm. it, it couldn't it couldn't come through um which is interesting because it then opens up the whole thing about the abuse of labor practices of the software of the, of the video game industry et cetera, et cetera. We it was a precedent setting case though where usually it's like this game sucks i hate it we move on a vendor instead said no no we're done you're you cannot use our platform to transact that's a great example because it it really highlights supply chain issues. So if you if one of your suppliers, one of your vendors is impacted by your crisis, then obviously it compounds your crisis. Conversely, if one of your suppliers or one of your vendors has a crisis, that could impact you. So it really goes multiple directions there. Um, and that's that's true for a lot of things. We've seen a lot of that as a result of, and I, you know, I keep coming back to the COVID-19 pandemic. We're going to talk about it a lot, um, but that's because it is global and everybody is aware of it and everybody's dealing with it still. Um, but there have been a lot of supply chain impacts as a result of the pandemic, thinking through. Um, these are fantastic examples. Thank you all so much for sharing, um, both putting it into the Minty tool and also verbally. I really appreciate it. Um, these are great examples. I want to, I'm going to um, move on though, because we've got a few other discussion questions to hit. Uh, so our next one, hopefully, will be, so what type of crisis that may affect your organization are you concerned about? So another way to think about this is what risks your organization keep you up at night? What are you concerned about that you're not sure that your company is going to be able to respond with existing resources, plans, preparedness? Um, so some, some types of examples that you might be concerned about are natural disaster, data breach, reputation issues, supply chain disruption, et cetera. And this one, I'm, a, I'm not going to ask you to state out loud what you're concerned about, because I think that would be very concerning for confidentiality reasons. So again, sharing this within the Menti tool, just typing it in, it is anonymous. I won't know who put it in. Nobody else will know who put it in. Um, but just what types of crisis situation or scenario would you be concerned about thinking? So um, just kind of what, what do you lose sleep over? What do you worry about? And you may need to refresh the browser for Menti that you that you were in if it doesn't update automatically for the refresh. Reputation, Amazon changes. Amazon changes is, I would imagine that's gonna be a big concern for your industry. Yeah, I, I think that's gonna, that's gonna keep a lot of y'all up at night. Uh, social media, absolutely. Data breach, everybody's very concerned about data breach. Monopolies, yes. Absolutely. Cash flow crisis. Good. Social media smackdown. Not please representation. Indigo bankruptcy. Staff quitting or ill. Key employee illness. Objectionable content. Racism. Uh, where else? Someone's past. CEO fired. Data loss. App store policy changes. Staff burnout. Health crisis. Self staff. Uh, claims of racism, staff leaving, loss of government funding, inadvertent errors, controversial author, data breach again, employee burnout, trying to follow the ones. <laughs> I'm seeing now the flaw. I'm using a word cloud. <laughs> I'm having trouble following them, but I'm trying to read out all of the ones that I'm seeing to make sure that we're capturing, that our wonderful captioner is able to capture all of it. Um, Key employee illness keeps getting mentioned. That's interesting. I wonder if we had asked this question in 2018, would key employee illness have been such a concern or is that really a new concern because of the pandemic? Um, racism, social media, staff leaving. I'm gonna allow you all a few more minutes to churn on that and, and say where your concerns are. I did read an interesting study um, that was published by Fleischmann Hillard High Road, which is the Canadian arm of Fleischmann Hillard, which is a global public relations firm. And they did a study examining um, attitudes about corporate crisis across different, different countries. So looking at Canada, the US, the UK, Germany, China, et cetera. So several different countries. Um, and they found that Canadian consumers are really much more concerned about um, 
about their com about companies that they patronize that they that they give their business to taking a stand against racism against white supremacy and and really Canadian consumers want companies to take much more progressive stances than consumers in other countries that they that they studied which I thought was really interesting um, and one reason that I'm very excited to be working with you for this for tech forum um, because you have that that perspective and you understand that companies need to really be clear what they're communicating in regards to racism and white supremacy and past behavior of executives that kind of thing so I do think it, it's it's a different environment for folks in Canada than it is in other countries. Um, and it's certainly something to be aware of. Um, so looking through some of the responses, this, this is really, really good, um, good choices. Well, not good. This makes it look like none of you are sleeping ever, which is not good. I want you all to be able to sleep at night. Um, but things that you're concerned about, cultural appropriation, keeping up with technology, um, harassment by members, agents, social media blow up, controversial authors, monopolies, um, staff burnout, mental health, vendor issues, being called out, exclusivity demands, interesting, um, harassment of authors, yeah, minimal staff redundancy, harassment of staff, inadvertent errors, yeah, these are really great options. And again, I will include the um, final results of this in, in the PDF of the slides that we send out following. So you'll be able to review this later on. Um, and this is also gonna be, we're gonna talk later on about how do you have conversations within your organization to start planting the seeds of, hey, do we have a crisis management program? Do we need to start thinking about this? This is gonna be a good tool for you to use within your organization to start having those conversations. Um, so you will have, have these word clouds to take with you further on. Um, I am going to move on to the next slide. Oops, oops, not that one. Apologies. Uh, I switched windows, that's the problem. Okay, can you all still see the word cloud currently? Thank you. Okay, um, so moving on to the next question, and again, you may need to refresh your browser with the Menti page, but thinking through, other than the COVID-19 pandemic, has your organization experienced a corporate crisis? And I just want you to answer yes or no, or not that I know of. Um, and you can also think of this as, has any organization where you've worked in the past experienced a corporate crisis? So it doesn't necessarily have to be one where you're working right now. And don't consider COVID-19 pandemic because that affected everybody. Um, but has your organization experienced a corporate crisis or has any organization that you've worked for experienced a corporate crisis? Um, this is so far 13 yeses and five no's or not that I know of, um, 14, 15 and six. So this is just letting you kind of know that many folks on the call have dealt with corporate crises, um, either working for an organization that has been going through a crisis. Some of you may have been involved in responding to a corporate crisis either with your current organization or in a past organization. Um, but I wanted to ask this question, highlight this, to get to the point that our past experiences inform how we view crisis management and what actions we take going forward. So keeping in mind, as you are starting to have conversations within your organization about, do we have a crisis management plan or program? Do we need one? Do we, how do we wanna kind of approach that? knowing that it's very, very common that people will have experienced a corporate crisis for an organization that they work for, um, much more common than you may have realized. So it looks like currently we've got 16 yeses and eight no's or not that I know of. So twice as many folks just in this session have lived through or experienced a corporate crisis for the company that they work for. Um, another good one to take with you as you're, as you're starting these conversations. Uh, and the next question, this is the last one on the Minty code, and this is, you'll have a slider response. So I would love to answer two questions. My organization has responded well to the COVID-19 pandemic, and you'll tell me on a scale of one to five, strongly disagree or strongly agree. Strongly disagree is one, strongly agree is five. So has my, your organization responded well to the COVID-19 pandemic? And has your organization communicated effectively about their pandemic response? So I asked two different questions there intentionally. 
Um, has your organization responded well to the COVID-19 pandemic and has your organization communicated effectively about your pandemic response? Um, and I'll give folks a few, uh, another minute to answer here. So we're seeing kind of the average results. Um, once you answer, you can check on the screen and see how, what other folks are answering. This is, and keeping in mind all that we're, that I'm asking you this question more than a year into the pandemic now. So this is, I imagine if I'd asked you this question and on May 1st, 2020, your response may have been a little bit different, but since we have had time, we've got a little bit of hindsight and also acknowledging that the pandemic is not over. Um, but overall, how has your organization responded to the pandemic? So it looks like on average a 4.3, so mostly agree to strongly agree that your organization, organization has responded well to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and an average um, four out of five, so agreeing that your organization has communicated effectively about the pandemic response. I'll be honest with you, I was expecting to see a bigger difference between those two numbers. Um, I've seen a lot of, of organizations that have a plan and have carried out a solid response to the pandemic, but have not been as good about communicating what their plans are for their employees, for vendors, for customers, et cetera. Um, and I asked these two different questions specifically to highlight the difference there that even if you have a very good crisis response, you have to also communicate that well with all of your various potentially impacted stakeholder groups. Um, and that's one reason that communicating in a crisis is so vital to a successful response. Um, and I'm gonna ask this, but please do not feel obligated. Does anybody wanna share anything that your organization you think has done particularly well in responding to the pandemic? If nobody responds, that's okay. You can also share verbally or in the chat, but just examples of maybe things that surprised you with how well your organization responded. I'll jump in if nobody else will jump in. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, what was great about Kobo's response was, first of all, we got lucky in some vision of, of senior leadership that we had a test day uh, the Tuesday before everything went work from home, sort of that mid-March period, literally like just days before we had a trial run of nobody's allowed in the office, let's see if the company collapses. Mm. So just like if we had to, because we might have to, let's mm -hmm. see. And then let's let's start fixing all the things that were problems on on stay at home Tuesday. Um, so it was so we were starting from that mindset of things might have to change radically. So let's do a low risk version of it, and 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 just inculcate a culture of like it's going to be rocky. No one's no one's in trouble for for bumps in the road, and mm -hmm. we're just making a list of issues to to work through. And that was like the attitude from the get go. So then when the whole world got thrown sideways, we had already been set up with that attitude of. Um, we will figure it out. Whatever the problem is, we will figure it out. And that was, that was a good attitude to start with. That's a great point. There's a, um, a saying that's very common, I think, in folks that come from a military background that you want to you wanna bleed in training rather than in war. So the idea that practicing in advance, learning all of those lessons in a safer environment is much preferable than <laughs> finding out when you're really in, in the heat of the moment. Great example, Nathan, thank you. Anybody else have an example they wanna share about a, a good response to the COVID-19 pandemic? We had a, a comment in the chat from Michelle who said, allowing staff at all levels to contribute their thoughts and ideas. Oh, I love that. Thank you, Michelle, that's a great point. Um, and I really, I think we're gonna come back to that as well throughout this is, making sure that you're listening to your staff, not only providing them the option to provide that, that feedback to senior leadership, but making sure that you're communicating to them, here's how you let us know your, your concerns, your opinions, your thoughts, your ideas, and also allowing them the space and the freedom to be able to communicate that. That's a great point. Um, Alex, I see that you've got your hand raised, so I'm gonna call on Alex. 
Yeah, trying not to interrupt. Um, I guess it was, I, I use a lot of analogies and, and what I say frequently is, is this was a frog in the pot year. You know, that analogy of if you put a frog in a pot and turn on the heat, it slowly boils to death. But if you throw it in boiling water, it jumps out. Um, but but that that reaction to jump out, and I guess I, I was particularly proud of, of our board for, for taking some pretty bold steps, um, but that the, the situation uh, necessitated. Um, so I think bold action would be something I was, um, I thought we did particularly well. That's a great, I love that analogy, actually. That's great. And it's something too that makes this type of the frog in a pot type of crisis far more challenging actually is when you've got the type of crisis where there's a very clear activating event when something very definitively happens and you know right away we need to respond to this that's certainly easier you know you need to activate your team you know you need to respond to it the ones that are more of the slow burn crises are much more challenging because it's still the onus is on somebody in the organization to say we need to activate the team and then sometimes you might get pushed back and say, no, 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 that's not really a big deal. We don't need to activate it. We've got too much other stuff going on. So you really do have to have to find that balance between when do we activate versus when do we just monitor. Um, and that's tricky for so many organizations of every industry, every size, every location is, is finding that sweet spot of knowing when to activate, especially for the slow burn or the frog in the pot crises. It's a great point, Alex. Thank you. Um, we, have a, we have another comment in the chat from Tamara, uh, who said that her company communicated that their first priority was to do their best to ensure that they all kept their jobs. Boy, that is solid internal crisis communications. That's something that is so important, is making sure that your employees know what your priorities are and that they know that you're looking out for them. That's huge. There are so many companies that, that don't focus on that that really should. It's a great point. Thank you. Any other examples of, of things that your, your company has done well to respond? OK. Um, then moving on, and again, I will include all of all of these minty results in the, the slides for you. Um, but going on, we talked about what is a crisis, we talked about good crisis management. So going into what is an effective crisis management program require? So I've broken out these kind of three main bullets, or three main ideas that building a good crisis management program requires. This is not an exhaustive list by any means. <laughs> this is just how are we going to give you the tools that you need to start building a good crisis management program. And I say that start building. Your organization may already have a crisis management program, in which case you can take what you learn from this session and hopefully use it to improve. There's always our goal is to improve. There is no perfect crisis management program anywhere in the world. Every single one of them has room for improvement always and always will. But in general, effective crisis management programs require executive buy-in and support. So if your top, le top level leaders in your organization do not care about the crisis management program, you're not gonna have a very good crisis management program. So leadership must set and own the strategy. That does not mean that your CEO needs to be the leader of your crisis management team. Sometimes your CEO will not be the best leader for your crisis management team. We see this a lot, especially in larger companies um, that have a board of directors. Typically, the CEO will need to be available to sometimes serve as a spokesperson to the media. They'll need to be able to, to communicate with the board of directors, and they may delegate the crisis response activities to a crisis management team. It may be other high-level leaders, other senior-level leadership, but it might the CEO may or may not be a member of the crisis management team. But the CEO does need to be, a, be familiar with the program and make sure that it's a priority for the company. Um, cultural and organizational fit. There is no one size fits all approach for crisis management. There are certainly standards out there for crisis management, but, they, but the standards even that exist for crisis management are designed in a way to be implemented to fit a, per, your particular organization's culture, organizational structure. We don't want to implement a crisis management team structure that is vastly different from your normal organizational structure because it's not going to work in a crisis. We want to make sure that it is closely 
follows your inherent organizational structure as possible, because again, we want to try and eliminate as many obstacles as we can in advance. So we want to make sure that we create a crisis management team that matches very closely your organizational structure. Caveat there is there are some key roles that will need to be a part of the crisis management team, and you might have somebody, a C-suite level person who owns, for example, uh, human resources and communications, that really needs to be two different people on a crisis management team because those are two very difficult, challenging roles in a crisis. So we'll need to, you know, you might need to adjust your crisis management team to make sure that you've got those really challenging roles to one person each. Um, it's very difficult to wear two hats in a crisis and it's not a good look. It's just not fashionable. I'm sorry, that was a very dumb joke. Moira Rose can wear two wigs, but you cannot wear two wigs in a crisis. Another Shit's Creek reference. Um, Awareness and education. If your employees do not know that you have a crisis management program, it does not do you much good. To the, the example of, of the company that let their employees know that their priority in dealing with the pandemic was ensuring that everybody would still continue to have a job. Mwah. Love that. Chef's kiss. That's really, really good. So that said, does every employee in your company need to be familiar with your plan? Does everybody in your company need to be a member of your crisis management team? No, absolutely not. Um, unless your company is only three people, then maybe. Um, but for most companies, you typically, you don't need to have, every, every employee does not need to know every single detail of the crisis management program, the crisis management team, et cetera. But they should all be aware that there is a senior level leadership team that is designated to respond in a crisis. And they will need to know how to notify or report of any potential issues. This is that idea that communication has to go multiple directions, especially in a crisis. So you want to make sure that your crisis management program that you're building allows for communication from the crisis management team to all employees and all stakeholder groups and vice versa. You want to make sure that all of that information about what's going on in the ground can has a way to get efficiently and quickly up to the crisis management team. That said, you don't need all of your crisis management team members constantly monitoring social media in a crisis, but you do need to have designated media monitoring that can quickly analyze and report to the CMT what's the common narrative of the crisis, for example. Um, so, and that's really one of the most challenging aspects of building out an effective crisis management program is making sure that you're allowing the structure for that communication in multiple directions. Um, but also just letting your employees know that you have a crisis management program, that it exists, is very, very important. So here is your handy dandy guide to how do we start implementing a good crisis management program. And again, if you've got a crisis management program in place, how do you improve upon it? Um, so I've got two steps for you that we're going to go through in this session. Step one is start asking questions. And step two is conduct a post-incident review. So. Um, and these, the slides that have the green stars in the corner, these will be, all of this information is directly in the handouts that you'll receive following the session. So you don't have to worry about screen caps or anything like that. This is all coming to you in PDF and accessible form following the session. So I'm going to encourage you to start asking questions in your organization. You might be the highest level person in your organization. If so, that's great. You can still ask some of these questions you'll just need to choose your audience wisely. So keep in mind as you go through asking these questions, who are you asking them to? Are you asking senior leadership in your organization? Are you asking employees in general? Are you asking um, people outside of your organization as well? Are you asking uh, other people in your industry, other people in your community? Are you asking um, customers, vendors, suppliers, that kind of thing. So you're going to need to use a fair amount of judgment as you go through these questions. So who you're, who you're asking. Informal and conversational is a really good place to start. We want to start by planting the seeds to really drive further conversations. So you don't need to have a structured major come in with a meeting agenda and we're going to hit all these items on the agenda. You don't need to do that just yet. But just start, start having informal conversations. And I realize that's a little bit more challenging to do while people, while a lot of people are still working from home because of the pandemic, um, but it's absolutely manageable. So just start having these informal conversations. Keep in mind that people may become uncomfortable quickly because everybody's past experience dealing with a crisis and any type of crisis, not just a corporate crisis, 
that can really influence how they respond to hearing these questions. So be very, very mindful of that when you start asking these questions. I would recommend if you're not at a place where you're, where you're working in person yet, um, and I know a lot of people are not, if you're gonna have these conversations over Zoom or over Teams or whatever your video conferencing is, I would recommend if possible, do it with cameras on so that you can pick up on nonverbal cues because that, that can be a really good indicator of when you might need to stop asking questions if it's not being received well, if something is being is something is coming up from for whoever you're talking with. So really, I would encourage you to ask them in a way, way where you can get eyes on the person that you're talking with and pick, be able to pick up on those nonverbal cues. Um, keep in mind also that sometimes just asking these questions can be enough to spur action. Asking the questions of, of senior leaders of, what keeps you up at night? What are you worried about? Is a really good way to just kind of have them start churning and thinking through, maybe we ought to do something about that. Um, and again, previous experiences will inform responses. A lot, uh, a common, common side effect of living through a crisis is trauma. Um, and as you know, from trauma response, that can come up in unexpected ways in the future. So again, that's why I encourage you to make sure you can see the person that you're talking to when you're talking with them. Um, so that you, you can pick up on those nonverbal cues. Um, do not ask all of these questions that we're gonna go through. <laughs> you will not need to ask all of them. Certainly do not ask all of these questions to the same person. They will think that you uh, are plotting something. So that's something to be mindful of as well. I would encourage you to start from the perspective of, I, um, I attended a crisis management session at Tech Forum. It was really thought provoking. People in the session shared examples of corporate crises. It got me thinking about this. Absolutely use that as an excuse. Um, and just be mindful again of, of how you ask questions. Um, and also don't ask only one person. You wanna try and get a flavor throughout your organization of what other people are thinking, where their mindset is in terms of crisis preparedness. So what are some questions to ask? Um, and again, you're going to need to adjust these for audience, for who you're talking to, but start asking what crises has our organization or our industry experienced? And you can use the, the word cloud that we generated together as an example of some other crises that people are thinking about. Um, do we have an existing crisis management plan or program or an existing business continuity plan or program? And there's, I'll give you a quick overview. Um, within my industry, the crisis management, business continuity, resilience industry, some people believe that crisis management is the end all be all umbrella and then everything else falls under that. Some people believe that business continuity is the end all be all umbrella and everything falls under that. Some people believe that IT disaster recovery is, et cetera. Irrelevant for the starting conversations. You just wanna ask, do we have anything existing? Because a lot of companies will have some kind of plan in place already. It may not have been a plan that has been updated within the past several years. So it might be sitting in a binder on a shelf somewhere gathering dust, in which case it's probably not doing a lot of good. Um, but it's a good way to, to just kind of ask, what, if, what kind of preparedness activities have we engaged in in the past? How long has it been since we've updated our plan? That kind of thing. Um, that's a good starting point. Start asking who might be our partners in responding to a crisis. And this is especially true for smaller organizations. If you don't have um, an internal, if you don't have a general counsel, if your organization is too small where you don't have a chief legal officer or general counsel and you rely on external counsel on, on an external law firm for your legal needs, that's an example of where in a crisis, you might wanna partner with whatever external counsel firm you normally rely on to help you out in a crisis. If so, you wanna make sure that they are part of your crisis management team. Um, so understanding is an example of how we need to make sure that the crisis management principles standards apply to your organization. So you might not have internal legal, you might not have internal um, public relations, you might rely on, a, on an external PR firm to handle your, your communications and your marketing outside of your company. If so, they need to be involved in your planning process for crisis management. Um, but that's also a good way asking this question of who might our partners be in responding to a crisis. 
it's a good way to start thinking through who are those potentially impacted stakeholder groups as well. So some of those stakeholder groups that we would need to communicate with in a crisis might also be those same external partners that we're responding with. It might not be, but it's a good way to start kind of feeling out what already exists. You'll also want to uh, start asking who might be impacted by our crisis. And a good way to start thinking through that is thinking through what types of corporate crises have has our company gone through, have others in our industry gone through, what else have we seen in the news, using that, that first word cloud that we did of the examples of corporate crises. If something that happened to this company happened to us, who might be impacted by it? It's a good way to approach that. You'll also wanna start asking, how does our organizational culture shape our ability to prepare for and respond to crises? So this is a big one. This is gonna, this is going to inform a lot of information sharing. Are we an organization that typically does not cooperate across silos, or do we work cross-functionally on a regular basis? A lot of that is going to, is going to shape how you develop your crisis management program. Um, awareness among employees and suppliers, thinking through, again, our employees, our suppliers, our main stakeholder groups will eventually need to know that we do have a crisis management program in place, and we're going to need to empower them and give them the ability to notify us if there is a crisis that we need to be aware of so that we can quickly activate and respond. Um, and again, that's part of that notification of potential incidents. So if your company has um, an ethics hotline, for example, can be a good notification tool that if all employees already know that there is a hotline number they can call if they become aware of an ethics issue that they need to raise to senior management, even if it's anonymously, working with whoever answers that ethics hotline and letting them know, hey, if, if it's, you know, these kind of, this type of crisis, here's how you escalate it. Um, so thinking through and talking through those kind of things, and this is not gonna be something you're gonna solve right away, but it's good to start asking these kind of questions and thinking through what do we already have in place? What communication channels do we have in place? What relationships do we have in place already that we can really build upon to build out a solid crisis management program? Do we have any, I wanna pause for a minute because I've been talking an awful lot. Any questions or comments at this point about these questions or about crisis management in general? <laughs> Hi, this is Teresa, can you hear me? I can, Teresa, hello. Hi, thank you so much for this presentation. I'm curious about whether crisis management is always something you think of at the full organization level or whether it's possible to do with a smaller group, for instance, to do crisis management within the department I manage in my larger organization. Great question, Teresa. Oh, I love that question. So I'm not gonna be able to give you a hard and fast answer on that because I don't know your organization. I don't know your department. I would, recommend that you start asking these questions both within and without and outside of your department. So start asking these questions inside of your department to get the flavor of what already exists, what's going on, but then also ask these questions outside of your department because there might be a plan or a program or a team in place that you're not aware of. There might be a top level um, crisis management team, but it might not be built out to, to include every single department, in which case that's certainly something that you wanna, do you wanna raise a flag for and say, hey, we're happy to play along. We just need to find a way to do it. This is also, um, it can be a bit more complex with larger, especially with multinational companies. So if you're part of a company that has um, global headquarters somewhere that is not in Canada, that, you, that um, they might have a corporate crisis management team based elsewhere, and they might have also a Canada crisis management team that's senior leaders within your particular branch of the company. Um, it may not. They might handle everything at headquarters. And a lot of that is, is driven by, by the culture of the organization. Um, is it a very centralized control organization or is it a federated organization? Um, so that's, that's a good question and I don't have an easy answer for you, but it is, it's going to drive how you start asking these questions and who you start asking questions to. Um, Teresa, in your case, I would recommend kind of asking these questions both internally and outside of just your department. Um, but that does, it indicates to me that you're gonna have more people that you're gonna need to ask these questions to. Does that, I realize that I can't give you a solid answer, so I would ask if that answers your question, knowing that it does not answer your question. <laughs> Do you have any follow-up questions, Teresa? 
No, that's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's a great, it's a great question. And I wish I had an easier answer for you. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? If there is a plan in place, who would be responsible for assessing it to make sure that it would meet, you know, the requirements of dealing with a crisis? Great question. And again, one that I do not have an easy answer for you. Um, I can tell you that my company, when we, so we're a consulting firm, we work with lots of different companies in lots of different industries. We don't have one particular person or role or function or department that we go into a company through. Sometimes we gain access to a new client through their security department. Sometimes it's through their finance department, um, especially if, if their risk management organization falls under finance. Sometimes it's through their human resources department if they're focused on kind of the people response. Sometimes it's through communications. Sometimes it's through IT. So there's really no hard and fast rule for who in an organization should own the program and therefore validate the plan and program and make sure that it's a, that it's a good fit for the organization and also meets crisis management standards. Um, so it's and it's exactly the reason why. I encourage asking these questions around your organization cautiously, carefully, with eyes on people that you're asking. Um, but it's a good way to feel out kind of, it, do we have a program in place? If so, who owns it? Who's responsible for maintaining the plan? Do we exercise the plan? Do we have a team established that goes through regular exercises? If we have new members to the team because of employee turnover or promotions or organizational changes, who trains those new members of the team? Who's responsible for ensuring that new members are brought up to speed on how the crisis management program works? Um, so those are the kind of kind of follow up questions that you can start asking to really to really suss that out. Um, but it's I don't have a good answer for you specifically. I will tell you that I have seen a lot of times communications will try and own it because because of Olivia Pope and because they think that crisis communications and crisis management are the same thing when they are not the same thing. Um, sometimes IT will try and own it because they're very, IT folks and especially information security folks, cybersecurity folks are responders and they know that they need to get in there and fix the problem fast if something breaks. So they're very much in the mindset of, I need to be the one to fix it. I have the expertise to fix it. Um, a lot of times we find that sometimes that they're very good at fixing things and they've got that deep technical expertise. They might not have the communication skills to be able to communicate what they're, what they're fixing, what is, what the status is and how that impacts the business. Um, we've seen a lot that for the same reason, security people, a lot of times own a crisis management program, because again, they're responders, they're fixers. Um, and a lot of times there's a lot of overlap between emergencies and crises. Um, but again, no matter where in the organization a crisis management program lives, it's going to need to really be shared cross-functionally because you're going to require that input and collaboration from different functions, different areas of the organization. Don, does that answer your question successfully? Yeah. Again, I know well, it doesn't. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do you have any follow-on questions? <laughs> Um, and these are these are great questions, folks. Thank you very, very much for, for speaking up and, and asking these questions. It's helpful. Um, does anybody else have any other questions so far? Questions about our questions, if you will. Okay, I've got um, some more questions for you to ask. Don't you love these questions? So as you're asking these questions, if you need a good starting point to think through, you can use the word clouds, the slides that we generated from the Minty thing that you'll have, but then also thinking through the COVID-19 pandemic response because it did impact everybody. Um, so start asking questions of how was our response to the COVID-19 pandemic? And again, big caveat, the pandemic is not over, <laughs> but so far, how has our response been? Were we able to shift to working from home seamlessly? Was that a challenge? Um, for a lot of companies, it was a challenge. For some companies, they realized that they were able to, to shift to that work from home, that work from home aspect very seamlessly, much more seamlessly than they anticipated. Um, you can also ask, have our internal communication methods or channels changed? Now that 
a lot of people are working from home, are we still able to communicate effectively with each other? Do we have to be very intentional, intentional about setting up regular Zoom calls? Do we have happy hour calls with staff members just to check in and make sure that everybody's actually doing okay? Um, that kind of thing. Asking, have we faced any supply chain issues as well? This is a good one to ask specifically for operations folks um, or for anybody that really is involved in any kind of supply chain in, uh, issues, thinking both supply chain sending out products and services and receiving products and services. So just like communication, it works multiple ways. Um, asking, how has our organization changed as a result of the pandemic? A lot of organizations have changed their structure, their business model, how they operate as a result of the pandemic. So it's a good way to ask that, a good time to ask that. Have, has our business changed as a result of the pandemic? Um, what lessons have we learned from living and working through the pandemic? Um, and then I would also encourage you to ask, to focus specifically on communication during and about the pandemic. Was our communication during and about the pandemic effective? Were employees updated regularly on the organization's priorities and actions? And I'm going to let you know, even if they say yes now, that may not have been true in April or May of 2020. It took a lot of companies much longer than it should have to figure out how to communicate effectively about the pandemic. Um, and a lot of companies still have not figured it out. Um, one thing that I'm always mindful of, but I, you know, I have a group of friends that because I'm a crisis management consultant, I've been texting them updates of for where we are in the pandemic, here's what you personally need to be doing to keep yourself safe, because that's just who I am. Um, and so a lot of them are coming to me now saying, you know, my company is starting to, to hint that they're gonna want us to go back into the office even though you know, many of us are not vaccinated. I don't know that it's safe. What do I need to do? So I've been talking with friends just outside of work you know, in a personal capacity about the kinds of questions to ask. And many of them are finding that they ask these questions about communication and learn that their company does actually have a plan in place. And they, and they look at the guidance that you know, in the US, it's the CDC, depending, it might be the World Health Organization, whoever is issuing the guidance, the recommendations, for levels of, of hygiene, for, for social distancing, for precautions to take, do they have those in place? And a lot of companies actually do have them in place, but just have not communicated that effectively to their employees. So that's why I really wanna focus on that communication aspect as well. Um, also asking, was leadership aware of employee concerns? And this is especially true for our organizations that have shifted to a working from home model. It is much more difficult to just become aware of what employees might be concerned about if you're not all physically in the same location. How is employee morale? How are your employees doing in the pandemic? Is everybody burned out? How do you know that they, if they say they're doing fine, are they actually doing okay? That kind of thing. So thinking through how effectively have we communicated? Also thinking how effectively did we communicate externally? Have we been communicating effectively with our vendors, suppliers, with our customers, with, um, with our community, that kind of thing. So just doing kind of a self-analysis a little bit about how well we've been communicating in the pandemic. As you're asking all of these questions, you may find that it's going to generate more questions, in which case I would recommend for step two, conducting a post-incident review. Again, with the caveat that we are not quite post-incident, we are not post-pandemic, we recommend that for any type of crisis, any time a crisis management team is activated, they conduct a post-incident review at the conclusion of the crisis. Sometimes a crisis will be concluded within a few hours, sometimes it's days, sometimes it's weeks, sometimes it's months, sometimes it's a year plus. Um, and if it is one of those longer year plus type crises, it may be beneficial to do a mid-incident review type thing. So that could be the, 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 the issue here. Um, but it's really time to reflect and study lessons learned. Um, and I encourage you to, if you're going to be conducting a post-incident review, to ask two questions. What went well? Or what did we do well? And what can we do to improve in the future? Um, and there's a really good, there's a way to structure it, but make it open-ended so you can elicit a lot of different responses and a lot of different feedback. So I recommend that you make it conversational, but structured or facilitated review of an incident that has just occurred. And again, with the pandemic, it's not over. I'm gonna stop giving that caveat, you all know this. Um, 
but it's a way to have a facilitated and open-ended conversation about to identify lessons learned from the experience. Additionally, conducting a post-incident review allows the responding team a chance to debrief, not only to identify our lessons learned, what, what we did well, what we can do to improve in the future, but also there's the emotional and psychological component of it as well. A lot of times, especially for very traumatic incidents, it can be very, very beneficial for a team that has responded to a crisis together to just take some time afterwards to debrief and talk about that experience. You can find that it helps release a lot of that tension. It helps them then be able to operate better moving forward. Um, it identifies lessons learned. It can be useful for improving in the future if you're identifying what we can do to improve. That's an easy win. It can also be helpful for training in the future. If you have new people come into your organization in the future and you want them to learn from, from your experience, having this post-incident review and the lessons learned documented is a great way, a great thing to use for training in the future. It also is helpful re for reducing liability. If it's a type of crisis where your company inevitably gets called into court, you can demonstrate, look, we conducted a post-incident review. Here are the lessons we've learned. Here are the actions that we have since taken to improve to ensure that we do better the next time. That can be very helpful. Lawyers love that. Um, looking at action items and parking lot items. Whenever I conduct a post-incident review, I always make sure that we're documenting action items and parking lot items. And what I mean by that is if we find a problem, either during the response or during that we uncover during the post-incident review, do we have a solution for it? Do we have a solution identified for that problem? If we do have a solution identified, that becomes an action item. It is something that is actionable. It is something that is assigned to a specific person or team to complete the action to create the solution to the problem. It's typically something that's assigned a deadline. So, and you can, you know, the person who's going to be assigned to will say, yes, I can have this completed by next Friday, for example. Um, but an action item is just that it's actionable, concrete method to improve. A parking lot item is something that you do not readily have a solution identified for. It's something that you know that you're gonna to have to work a little bit harder. It's gonna take more time to develop a solution. So typically when we have a bigger issue that becomes a parking lot item, we wanna make sure that we assign specific teams or specific people to collaborate in the future after the post-incident review session to then develop a solution. So we might not have a, a deadline for that specifically because we know we still need to develop the solution, but we do wanna make sure that we assign specific people or specific teams to collaborate together to identify what that solution may be. When you're conducting this post-incident review, consider who will be participating. Will it be just the people that were part of your responding team? Will it be all employees? Will it be your customers? Will it be your vendors, et cetera? So thinking through who do you want to participate? Think through who is facilitating. A lot of this is personality driven, but it needs it's going to need to be somebody who invites conversation, invites a, a open information, but also has the ability to, if somebody is rambling on, to shut them off, to cut them off when you need to and let them know, hey, that's a great point you're making. I'd love to circle back with you after the session and learn more is a very diplomatic way to do it. Um, Consider where bias might influence responses. How are we asking our employees to give us this input? And are they truly open to provide honest feedback with us? Um, that's, a, that's something that is challenging for a lot of leaders, but it's something certainly to consider that really is important. Think about timing after the incident for a non-pandemic crisis. We typically recommend conducting a post-incident review within about a week after the team is deactivated. So everything is still fresh in people's minds, but it gives people a chance to breathe <laughs> once the conclusion, once the incident is, is concluded. Um, and think about the duration and timing of the session. Do we wanna set aside an hour for the post-incident review session? Do you wanna set aside two hours? So thinking through how you structure it so that you can contain it really, so that it doesn't just draw on for hours and hours. Um, so wrapping up, um, again, we will be sending out um, these slides, including the results of the mentee poll that you all gave us with, this, with the great data and the feedback on the word clouds. Um, we'll also be sending out handouts that have the questions to consider asking and the guidance for asking those questions and information about how to conduct a post-incident review, what should be in your post-incident review. And just a reminder that our next session is on April 6th, and we're gonna be looking at understanding elements of a crisis management program how to identify and work with key partners in a crisis, how to recognize crisis management program elements and variables, and then how to make those fit for your organization. 
Any questions or comments? If you were to um, suggest sort of the top three leadership qualities for dealing with the crisis, what would they be? Oh, good question. In terms, are you talking about like who you want your crisis team leader to be? What kind of qualities you want that person to have? Yes, thank you. I want it to be somebody who has a broad purview of the organization, who understands the full spectrum of the organization, how it's structured, what the culture is how it operates. So they don't have to know every single detail, but they should understand generally what the business does and how it does it. I want it to be somebody who is respected throughout the organization because crises can really test the limits of patience, of interpersonal relationships. Crises can bring out a lot of egos and a lot of turf battles. So it needs to be somebody who is respected by everybody else on the team and who, if it gets really heated and really intense, the crisis leader can really kind of put a stop to bickering, to infighting, that kind of thing and say, nope, here's our priorities. Here's what we're focusing on. Um, and I want it to be somebody, first, I want it to be somebody who is empathetic because I want them to be able to think through what are the potential needs and concerns of all of those various stakeholder groups rather than we're only looking out for the needs of the company. I want them to be able to think beyond the company's needs as well. So that's my top three. Good question. Thank you. Any other questions or comments or concerns? Kinsey, do we have any in the chat that I'm not aware of? Uh, no comments or questions or concerns, just a lot of thanks and uh... Same. The session was great, and they're looking forward to the next one. Great. Thank yeah. you all so much. I am delighted with the responses that you gave to our questions, both on the mentee and verbally. Thank you all so much for your participation, for being so engaged, and for just being delightful to chat with. Thank you all so much. Well, thank I, you. Yeah. Thank you, Melissa. That was a great session. Thank and you. Uh, as you mentioned, everybody else has other questions, but otherwise, we're done. <laughs> Yeah, and as you mentioned, we'll be back here for part two on April 6th at 1 p.m. Eastern and 10 p.m. or 10 a.m. Pacific. And uh, we will be sending you all the materials that Melissa mentioned. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate your time. Thank you. <laughs>